real honor to have Amar Rangaswamy this morning. He is, my God, he's the ultimate networker, as you will learn. I first met Amar in the late 90s when he was running Sandhill Group, which is an angel investing firm, and it ran a lot of enterprise technology events. He has since started a few other things like the Corporate Eco Forum, which focuses on sustainability. And he's also very active with the Indian American community, bringing together entrepreneurs and politicians and policy makers. So the guy is amazingly networked. Amar, thank you for joining me. Hope you're doing all right. Feel free to fill the blanks. I, you know, I mean, your career is so long and admirable. Feel free to fill, fill the blanks. Yeah, Th thank you so much, Vinny, for having me. Uh, I've known you for a long time. Great to be on your on your show here. But uh, you know, uh, I, I've been thinking, what is a good way to describe me? Because my wife and family go, "What do you really do?" You know, because when I try to tell them what I do, uh, so I guess at a high level. Uh, I think I can describe myself as someone who likes to build networks and communities that make an impact. Uh, when I got to know you, I was building my tech network. Uh, you recall I had a uh, event called the Enterprise Retreat in uh, Pebble Beach, where we used to get the top 100 people in tech uh, for a good cause because everybody paid their uh, conference fees and we would then take all the profits and give them to nonprofits that were adjacent to the tech sector. You know, that's kind of how I got started at building communities was that philanthropic bent being introduced into the equation because otherwise it would be simply making money model, right? In this case, I was motivated to actually make money so that all of it could be given to nonprofits that could benefit both from the money, but also advice and mentorship from, uh, from tech leaders because we used to get the top 100 people if you recall in those days, these were guys like Hasso Plotner at SAP and Chuck Phillips, now known as Charles Phillips at Oracle and Infor, uh, Anil Bushri. I mean, these were all the leaders in our community. It, it was a great event. I mean, I, you know, at, in, in Pebble Beach, it, it was, you, you did a really nice job. So, so that's kind of where I cut my teeth, if you will, building that community. And then 10 years uh, into that, uh, building that network. You know, the, we, you and I have been in the more the enterprise B2B space. And if you remember in the mid-2000s, uh, uh, you know, the consumer stuff and other things became more sexy than enterprise. So I took a pause and uh, my kids were very young. They were eight and 10 or something like that, my daughters. And I said, how do I be a role model for these guys? You know, why would they like me anymore? And so I, uh, my friends told me, like Ray Lane and others, said, hey, look at green tech and clean tech. You've built this great network in the enterprise space. Go look at something else. And I said, that's a cool idea because young people will like me then. You know? So looked into it and talked to about 60 or 80 Fortune 500 executives to see what uh, was happening in sustainability and how they were kind of mitigating climate risk and so forth. And that was the basis for the Corporate Eco Forum which has now become a network of chief sustainability officers of 70 of the world's largest companies. So this is Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Disney, Ford, General Motors, you name it. They're all part of this network to really work on, like I said, greenhouse gas reductions, renewable energy purchases, sustainable supply chains, and so on and so forth. So that was my foray into a second network, again, to kind of help the world become a better place for your kids and mine more than ourselves. Uh, and then about eight years ago, I was going back and forth to India to help them set up a tech entrepreneurship system there. And we created this network in partnership with NASCOM, uh, the big Indian IT organization, to help kind of get the tech entrepreneurs together. And over 10 years, I helped them build this network of several thousand entrepreneurs. We meet every year in Bangalore. This year, it's going to be virtual because of the pandemic but really got that going. And I was thinking, what do I do with the Indian American community uh, in the US? And that's when, again, being an entrepreneur, I went to talk to about 100 leaders in the, in the uh, Indian American community and came up with this uh, new community called Indiaspora, which you can view as an Uber community. So this is a community of communities, if you will. We have doctors, lawyers, academics, politicians, business guys, billionaires, uh, nonprofit uh, leaders, everybody coming together for the greater good of the 4 million Indian Americans who live in this country. 
you know, it's amazing how you can, you, you're comfortable in so many different forums. Let, let's talk about, you know, in this series, I've been uh, cataloging all kinds of heroics during the crisis, right? In all the doom and gloom, it's actually been a remarkable time, right? Because we've seen all the healthcare heroics, but the massive scaling of work from home, the, um, the PPP production, the ventilator, auto companies jumping into make ventilators, the uh, pivoting, the j just on and on, you know, 5 million PPP loans to um, uh, small businesses from the SBA, just massive scales. Last mile delivery, logistics. Let's go through each one of your communities and tell me what you've seen that made you go, wow, I didn't think this was doable. Absolutely. Let's start, let's, start with, let's start with tech. Let's start with tech. Absolutely. So let's look at the enterprise space, right? Suddenly, you know, when the pandemic hit, everybody was scared, right? People said, oh my God, uh, what's going to happen? But within a couple of months, they were so resilient. And a lot of the technology that the enterprise market is developing is around digitization, right? Like uh, Satya famously said, hey, we've done two months, what would have taken us two years, right? So what has happened is really the surge in uh, interest in buying software, whether it's to make yourself e-commerce enabled, logistics, shipping, you name it. Every facet of the enterprise had to go online and had to go online fast. Uh, and so many of these enterprise companies have uh, really helped that move to digitization that Satya at Microsoft so, ta so talked about so much, right? It had to happen by all these innovative companies supplying software throughout the enterprise. So you can look all over, look at shipping, look at logistics, look at contactless customers. Uh, you know, all these areas you'll see enterprise software playing a role. But again, enterprise market is not sexy. It's plumbing. It's all that stuff. But what is enabling these companies, right? You know, Amar, one of the most really interesting things for me has been the vertical applications that have come into play, right? If you look at telemedicine and healthcare, yeah. if you look at the whole last automated warehouses and last mile delivery, the PPP loan processing and banking. The big guys actually couldn't do any of that. It's been specialists that have helped companies survive. Without them, they wouldn't have survived. Uh, so it, it's been, the enterprise market is expanding and it may not be sexy as you call it, but it's, if it helps you survive or thrive, from a CEO's perspective, that's pretty sexy. Absolutely. Yeah. And our network of the, uh, the 100 CEOs, uh, they had a small dip in the first quarter. Now all of them are growing robustly again. And in fact, many of them tell us that they will finish the year with uh, growth, if you can imagine. So it's being validated by the market, absolutely. So that's in the tech space. If you look at the uh, sustainability space, you know, again, there have been lots of uh, good and uh, good things and challenges. The good stuff is people stop traveling, you know? Suddenly, when you look at these large corporations, and again, at CEF, at the Corporate Eco Forum, our members represent $4 trillion of combined revenues. It's like a G7 nation, right? But suddenly, you had zero travel. So look at the greenhouse gas productions that was immediately achieved, right? That was one element. The other thing is employees start, stopped commuting. So you didn't have any of the commuting costs and commuting uh, greenhouse gas uh, you know, emissions, right? So all of a sudden, everybody noticed this huge dip uh, in greenhouse gases uh, and their emissions and so on. And the cust their customers did the same thing, right? So everybody went down. So that was a positive sign. Now coming out of it, what they got to do is to see how they can innovate to keep that low, right? You don't want the economy coming back up and everything going back up. So a lot of our members are telling us, look, uh, Zoom and all these video conferences are here to stay. We're going to really take a look at our travel costs and travel budgets more from a sustainability point than the actual cost itself, right? So things like that are happening all over the place. Have you, have you uh, in the forum, talked about the potential of a new administration, which looks more and more likely, and the focus maybe more on renewables? Has any of that come up? No, absolutely. Our members are already big time into renewable energy and uh, making huge purchase commitments over the past several years. 
And so that has all, always been ongoing, but I think uh, the, the uh, membership and the companies are looking for clarity. And you know, it was one of these things when uh, we were in the Paris Climate Accord, then we pulled out of the accord. You know, so you know, businesses don't want uncertainty. They want to know you're going one way or the other. I think with uh, potentially a new president coming in, I think uh, who has stated we'll get back into the climate accords and stuff, I think that I think will bring clarity to these people to say, hey, look, we are back in, we have these 2030 goals, 2050 goals, and you know how corporations work on based on objectives, based on goals. So I think uh, getting back into that mode of uh, climate accords and, and uh, you know, large agreements will actually benefit these companies because they have now goals to achieve. I just worry that we swing too much the other way and say, no fracking and so on. I mean, we've had such a huge economic advantage with all our natural gas. We need to be careful not to give up that advantage. But, but I'm glad you're discussing all those, all those issues, especially as, you know, what the forest fires you're having and the hurricanes we're having. So it's becoming more and more of an uh, public issue anyways. Yeah, and also with, uh, you know, also with sustainability, it's, there's a continuum, right? You kind of started with, with savings to strategic investments. Now it's also come to include gender diversity, inclusion, you know, and, 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 and uh, CSR and all those things. So I think sustainability now has a bigger role and a bigger footprint in a, in a good way to say it's more than just greenhouse gas reductions. It's the health of the entire company, the employees and so on and so forth. Yeah. You know, I'm, uh, Mark Benioff, CEO of Salesforce, he kind of threw away a statement. He says, is this a pandemic or an epidemic? It started off as a healthcare crisis, then it became a financial crisis, then it became a diversity crisis. But I like your definition of sustainability to, be, to include the diversity inclusion, not just the climate, climate issues. So let's talk about your third network. So now, yeah. now, now you become, we had lunch last year, and my God, you become a globe trotter. You're in, you're in Lords in, in, uh, in uh, England watching cricket, and God knows where all you are, Washington, D.C., hobnobbing with politicians. Uh, no, I think, I think the Indian community, as you well know, Vinny, uh, you're one of us. Uh, you realize in, in the short time as immigrants, you know, in the last 40, 50 years, we've grown to become not just 1% of this country, but 7% of the doctors, 10% of the IT workforce, uh, billionaires on the Forbes list, but also the biggest philanthropists are coming out of our community, right? So when the pandemic happened, the way in diaspora and our community reacted was one of giving. We started a campaign called Chalo Give that said, let's give to fight hunger, not just in the United States. You know, we gave, uh, we enabled a lot of food banks here, but we also gave to India where there was the migrant crisis, as you recall. So our program, Chalo Give, which is an online donor program, enabled 8 million meals to be given both in the U.S. and in India. And that's when you saw this outpouring of giving as opposed to getting. You know, and that's how we reacted in the, in the greater community of Indians, is what can we do to help people with hunger? Because there were 20 million people unemployed here, 100 million plus migrant workers in India going walking back home without food. And so that's when we saw the true spirit of our community come out. Fantastic, thank you for your service there in particular. Um, how do you see, I mean, you, you're obviously very connected to so many different executives. How do you see the economy evolving? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be an interesting uh, outcome of the elections. I mean, what it looks so far, and again, you know, this may get outdated by the time you broadcast this, but it looks like there will be a new president, but it also looks like there'll be a divided Congress. So when you look at it from a business point of view, that means you know, there won't be a more of a radical agenda that some people are expecting. It would be much more balanced where, let's say, corporations who are thinking, OK, my taxes are going to increase for my companies may be assured now that taxes are not going to go up. But on the other side, you know, we've had such a big crisis with the Black Lives Matter movement and so forth. A new president might actually become more of a unifier in that regard to tone down the rhetoric, 
to bring people together. So we may end up actually the election and the people, you know, our election voters are wise, you know, they, they wanted something that would appease everyone and calm people down and, and be one where there are no radical movements uh, in the economy. So we may have, in a sense, the best of both worlds come out of this election. I, you know, I agree with you. Having a Republican Congress and Democratic White House, let them, I, I like to say, let the politicians fight with each other. Then us business people can do our stuff. Otherwise, they meddle in our stuff. Let yeah. them have their own lane. Let them do their own stuff. That's um, awesome. So that's a good point. But how do you see the economy then? Do you see a V recovery? A U gradual recovery? What are you hearing? I think let's not, uh, uh, presidential change doesn't mean the pandemic goes away. I wish it would, yeah. right? But I think it's here to stay. The cases are increasing again. Uh, I think it's going to be stops and starts. You know, we're going to try and open and then something's going to come out and we're going to pull back a bit. So I really think the next couple of I'm years- a, yeah, I'm getting a W recovery. Yeah, it's, it's going to be that way. And I think we really do still need a, uh, you know, a lot of government inter intervention to really support uh, the people who are at the bottom of the pyramid, if you will. Because I think you know, wages are not going to go up. Employment is go, going to go up and down. So I think we still need government help in that regard. But I think once that goes through, the businesses can pick up. I mean, there's so many innovators- Businesses are smart. Uh, I think you just le leave them alone in a sense, and I think it will get back. But the pandemic is by no means gone away. So I think we have to kind of temper our, uh, our expectations. You know, Arthur, one of the best things that I've done, I've done about 75 of these interviews, and every one of you is outcome focused, stressed, but positive and optimistic. It just makes my day to talk to people like you because the media and social media is so negative in comparison, right? So thank you for your service. I'm going to do the Indian namaste here. Any final thoughts? No, I would say, you know, this country is amazing. I never will uh, think the United States. I'll never give up on the United States, people like you and me, and millions of immigrants over the 250 years have come to this country with this positive outlook that, you can do things that we couldn't do in our own countries and that this country is accepting of everyone. So I'm very bullish on the United States as we move forward. Thank you so much, MR. I appreciate your input and thank you for all your service.